I, I, you know, I've been looking at that, but that's sort of inter interesting. But do you feel like it sort of made you, I mean, I guess it, in a sense just it would, you'd be getting a real range of experiences and it would be almost the opposite of these kind of hyper-structure driven re repetition of skills, just in the sense that you'd be, you know, a range of different kinds of experience. So, um, yeah, that's interesting that that was a really good experience for you growing up. Just a comment on um, overstructuring children's time. As I'm a parent of young children, that I was really trying to reflect on why I assign them up for various activities. And the main reason, one of the main reasons, is because I can't let them just go play down the block because I'm worried they'll get, you know, taken by a pedophile. You know, living in the city, um, you know, I've got a six-year-old and a four-year-old, and I don't, I trust them, but I, it's very hard for me to trust the world particularly if I don't know my neighbors. So part of the reason I think is, you know, I don't, there aren't any kids playing on my block. You know, there aren't many kids around. So I find that I have to create activities. And I wish it wasn't so. I would love to just open the door and say, go explore the world, have a wonderful time. But it's hard to do. Well, that's interesting. One of the, um, one of the studies is actually a, a study sponsored by WISC, which, uh, you know, no, you know, grass stains, you know, so it was a very pro outdoor <laughs> play study. And, uh, and they found that there was an incredible, you know, reduction in, you know, the mothers who reported that they played outdoors, and the kids, that they did not have the inclination or the ability to let their children play outdoors, or felt that they did. So I think that is a, another um, factor in, in, in what we're talking about. Sure. That, that might be a peculiar problem for big cities too. I mean, with my kids growing up in New York, we lived in a seminary where it was the biggest playpen in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. You could just send the kids out. But when before we moved down, a little boy, nine years old, had a new bike for Christmas, went out to ride his bike, and came back without it because kids just took it. And that that's true in terms of that protectiveness. And, and I don't know whether it links in with this. The small community too, where people do know each other and so on. They watch too. They the watch. Small community. They keep an eye on each yeah. other. Yeah. yeah. If somebody's yeah. goofing off going down the street, their mother's over. probably going to hear yeah. about it from three shopkeepers. Yeah. At least that. <laughs> and we're living in a tremendous a lot of high stress, high anxiety about the world itself. So. Yeah. I had a question about if we're looking at this idea of gifted. But we translate that all into adult, mature adult, senior people, can we? Have we done any research reading on what is the parallel of putting those two together? So we're not just looking at the gifted in the child, but what about the gifted in the retired person now? Are there cyclical things that they can experience that maybe that gives us some insight how to look at this whole thing on a much bigger picture? So, gifted, the giftedness, how it repeats, and how it does a cycle of it. it because, you know, when I, I jokingly said, now that you're not gifted, but you're obviously creative and working and functioning in the world. And um, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, um, I guess uh, that, are, are there studies? No, there's, there's two or three major studies. Um, one was uh, of what happens later. The, the Lewis Terman, who was, um, you know, the force behind the Stanford Binet, as you guess, that sort of started a study out in, out in actually, I think, in, in, around here, of a cohort of kids who scored well on IQ tests and, and was longitudinal. But they're started, I think, in, I believe, in the you know, the 20s, and it, it isn't even over yet, you know, because there's still some survivors of it. Um, and it was looking at what, what became the, I mean, my problem with some of the criteria of it earlier is it sort of, uh, it was if there might have been a race bias and, or gender bias, and there's all sorts of stuff in that. And some of the questions they were asking, or you know, finding happiness is whether, you know, people were married yet, and things like this. Um, and then there's another study of people who went to CTY, which is uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Math and Science program, and so again, long ago, well, what happened to them later. Um, but I didn't feel like either of those studies really answered that question. I mean, one of the, I guess so I, I could only answer it from the people I spoke to. So 
So I told you about the 100 of these epicons, these gifted kids, and you know, what patterns I sent in them. And I think for me, the most successful ones were those who were able to, they were classical musicians, brilliant classical musician named Matt Hanvitz, Matt Hanvitz, um, who had been trained rigorously and was a prodigy. And now he was this very inventive uh, cellist who was doing kind of uh, his own versions of Jimi Hendrix as classical music. And it's, I mean, that might sound sort of odd, but it was incredible. And the distinction to me was that he was able to sort of use the rigor, break it down, turn it into something new. And um, was he stopped being a sort of a mere instrument or a vessel and became and had brought his own voice more into it. And that seemed to be the the, the later on for a lot of those kids that was the that was the distinction between those who were um, who felt like they survived well and those who felt like they hadn't. Hi, um, I have a question about giftedness because I've grown up with gifted people my whole life and I guess my question is just really who's service. And um, when I was in academia, uh, I saw giftedness as being the development of certain skills and abilities. And now that I've been in business for 15 years, and I look at the world and the kind of skills that make people successful in the businesses I've been in, which involve a lot of change and, and innovation, I see that it's really that there's skills that gifted kids frequently don't develop. There are skills in negotiation, there are skills in anticipation, there are skills in self-regulation. There are all kinds of skills that I guess the emotional intelligence and you know various social um, theories predict. And I'm wondering, because we are in a place of faith, you know, um, how you see developing faith in these kids. Because I'm not sure that having more kids who are going to be good at discrete activities is really going to be what's going to, you know, help the world in 30 years when we're dealing with major issues that that need to be solved. Well, that's a great point, and one of the some of the there's also in addition to a more structured time, there's also a lot less recess hours, and then the schools are, there are no recess, but it's been cut back, and um, there's been sort of scholars of play, it's like my favorite kind of play studies, you know. and, um, and it, that it makes a huge difference in how individuals negotiate their adult life, whether they have uh, play time with other children. I mean, it's pretty basic, but, um, and not just because of, you know, letting off steam or whatever, but because it, there was a kind of an emotional intelligence and a learning and a, um, even like things that are kind of dark, the dark elements of play or domination of other people. I mean, some of these things are actually really quite important in uh, negotiating uh, power or relationships with other people and, you know, not, not trying to over, overpower other people. So, um, and, and, lear and learning about power. Um, and so, I, I guess, to me, play is a very, very important part of children and also everybody's life. Um, 